started telling the truth to people, you know, about 50 some years ago. I said, uh, you know, for the twice in his lifetime, he's trying to save the whales from the stupidity of man, and now he's trying to save humanity from the stupidity of man. So, uh, 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 let, let me please welcome Dr. Patrick Moore. Um, I just love Alberta. I feel like at home in this province, even though I've lived in BC all my life, I actually feel more at home in Alberta in some ways because I don't get a lot of uh, attention in BC from the power structure, but uh, I keep working at it. My ancestors, my mom's side, my dad's side, were all loggers and fishermen. That's how I grew up. I grew up, I grew up here. That's my dad's floating logging camp on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the most northern harbor on the west coast of Vancouver Island. In those days, there isn't a farm within 50 miles of this place. And uh, all the food and supplies came by freight boat from down island because there was no road here until 65. And in 65, we thought, now the people will come and this place will grow. Half the people use the road to get out. <laughs> Learn something about human nature once in a while. Well, I got shipped off to boarding school in Vancouver where I excelled in science and then ended up at the University of British Columbia doing a honors bachelor of science in forestry and biology and uh, human biochemistry and all that sort of thing. And uh, then I went into a PhD in ecology at UBC. I had some of the best professors, uh, David Suzuki, who turned into a kind of weird guy. <laughs> in those days when he was a professor, he, he taught genetics like you wouldn't believe. They, they had just figured out the whole genetic sequence of how DNA works and how it goes out into the, uh, into the, the uh, cell and makes proteins and all that sort of stuff. It was fabulous. So I, I got a really good grounding in science before I uh, joined Greenpeace while I was doing my PhD. Now we look like a bunch of hippies, and indeed it was the hippie era, but every one of the people on the, this first voyage of Greenpeace was a professional of one sort or another. There's engineers and doctors and lawyers and journalists and ecologists, and uh, it was a really interesting group of people. And uh, this is uh, our first encounter with the Soviet, at that time called Soviet factory whaling fleet in the North Pacific. I'm driving this little boat with my late friend Fred Easton, a cameraman, documenting all of this. That, that hole in the back of the factory ship is where the whales go up to get chopped up on deck. And uh, you can see some whales hanging on the harpoon boat there, getting ready to be taken over there. So this was the first time anybody had gone out onto the oceans to confront <coughs> whaling fleets fleets of 16 harpoon boats and the factory ship. And that's me driving a Zodiac in front of the harpoon uh, to protect the fleeing whales. Uh, and it took four years of voyages into the Pacific to get them to stop doing this. And by 1980, we started in 75, and by 1981, the International Whaling Commission banned all ocean-going whaling in the world. our early campaigns against nuclear testing, I think a lot of people know that that's where we started, against the U.S. hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska and the French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. We stopped both of those programs in their tracks. And in a way, about 16 people on a boat took on the world's largest, most powerful uh, government organization, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, and we won. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here we are out in front of the whaling's harpoon. I'm driving the boat with the cameraman in it. And my, my friends Bob and, and uh, George are in the Zodiac in front of the boat there. The, the whale's out in front of them. We got to the point where I was afraid we were going to overrun the whales. 
you can see the, the, the shoulder with the blowhole come right out of the water. And then uh, we can see the guy crouching, getting ready to shoot. The only rule we kept was every time they pointed the gun another way, we'd swim along in front of that. And uh, we came up in one wave, and there he was, and we were looking right in the back. I thought we were kind of plugged, like you know, he couldn't possibly shoot. Then we went down, and then that fantastic sound, and you could hear the of the, of the cable. And I guess we both ducked at that point, and I don't know what happened. Canada, this was quite controversial in our country here, but they were killing 250,000 nursing baby seals on the ice floes. You know, and then, and then the, you'd see the mothers come up to their skin pup and put their chest over it and actually shed tears. I saw this with my own eyes. They are mammals like us, and they have a bond with their child like we do. And it was, it was not because of extinction. It was because of humanitarianism and just plain manners about how we should deal with the living world that we have, uh, uh, have the benefit of having around us. They, they took my, my, my belt off when I, they put me in the jail cell so I wouldn't hang myself. Um, Greenpeace, I left Greenpeace after 15 years of full time in the top community as we evolved into an international organization with offices in eight countries. and. Uh, a big amount of money coming in. And I had to leave in the end because first, the philosophical level, Greenpeace decided that people were the enemies of the earth, the, the, the enemies of life, as a, as a philosophy. Now we started with green peace. That's the human part. We want peace in this world. And so we cared about people. All the people who started Greenpeace cared about people and the, the fact that there could be a nuclear war and annihilate half the population of the world. So they, they, that got dropped. All of a sudden, humans were being called the enemies of nature. And though the, the specific thing that made me leave was all my other directors, none of them had any formal science education. They were political activists, social activists, or just people who wanted to be on the Greenpeace train. And uh, they decided we should ban chlorine worldwide, with capital letters, ban chlorine worldwide, would be a new international campaign for Greenpeace. I said, hold it, you guys. Table salt, sodium chloride, is an essential nutrient for all animal life. It's true that chlorine can be used as a weapon, but so can a lot of things. That doesn't mean you ban the whole thing. And then, I reminded them that adding chlorine to drinking water, swimming pools, and spas was the biggest advance in the history of public health, preventing the spread of communicable diseases. And 85% of our pharmaceuticals are, are based on chlorine chemistry, and about 25% of all our pharmaceuticals have chlorine in them to, to make us healthy. So you can see why I had to leave. I could not associate myself with that particular campaign, and they went ahead with it that it didn't last for long. Okay, now we'll get into the extremely complicated stuff. This is the first, this is the last, the most recent 570 million years. This is about, 570 million years is about when multicellular life first emerged. For the first three billion years, life was all microscopic, unicellular, one cell, and invisible, like microscopic. And in the sea, there was no life on the land. So this is when life on the land started. So I'm not going to tell you much about the first three and a half billion years. But this half billion years is when all of modern evolution has occurred. You can see there, there's two main factors here. The blue line is temperature, and the purple line is carbon dioxide. You can see in that great big red circle there that are they going opposite to each other for over 150 million years. They weren't in any kind of cause-effect relationship at all. Many things come into 
what looks to be a cause-effect relationship because they're both moving in the same direction. But quite often they're both moving in the same direction because a third factor is causing both of them to move. Ice cream consumption and shark attacks is a perfect example. They are perfectly correlated. When ice cream consumption goes up, shark attacks go up. When ice cream consumption goes down, shark attacks go down. That's because people come to a beach in the summer, go swimming, get attacked by a shark, and then come in and have an ice cream cone, or maybe the other. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be very careful not to confuse these false correlations. There's a, a website called Spurious Correlations, which shows you the funniest ones that there are. There's hundreds of them, actually. So you can see here that CO2, since 146 million years ago, which is about halfway into that chart, has been steadily falling in the global atmosphere. And for the first 50 million years of that, temperature continued to rise into what's called the Eocene Thermal Maximum, which is this bit here. It's one of the warmest periods in Earth's history. And since then, in 50 million years, it has gone down, this is, the, this is 65 million years now, we're getting closer to the present. And uh, this is where the EFC thermal maximum, Antarctic glaciation didn't start to here. In other words, before that, for over 200 million years or so, there was no ice on either pole. And it wasn't until here, 5 million years ago, a little less actually, more like 3.5, that, that the northern hemisphere glaciation occurred. There was no ice on the Arctic either until then. And yet they tell us we're in too warm a period. And it's going to, if any little bit more warming, like they say 1.5 degrees, one of our directors on the CO2 coalition said that, how, how can people believe that 1.5 Celsius is going to destroy the world when, it, when it, the difference in temperature between breakfast and lunch is larger than that? Right? I mean, doesn't that put it into perspective? Anyways, we are in one of the coldest periods in Earth's history. This is now just the last 5.5 million years. And here we are cru cruising along up here, and all of a sudden, the Ice Age began. You can see that it is still getting colder. The Ice Age isn't over. People talk about the last Ice Age, meaning the most recent most recent glacial maximum, which, uh, if you go back, began here. And these are the cold periods. These are the cycles. 41,000 year cycle and 100,000 year cycle. Why it changed, we don't know. But we know it's caused by the gravitational effect of Jupiter. <coughs> the Melanchthon cycle. This is where people came in. We, we, we evolved at the equator, which when the Earth warms and cools, stays about the same temperature all the time. The main changes in temperature occur towards the poles, where there's no ice for long periods, and then there's ice for long periods. We don't know why this happens. And no one probably ever will. This now is getting really close to the future. This is the last 350,000 years. These are the results of ice cores in the Antarctic going down and drilling ice cores just like you do with, in geology with, with the drilling for stones and for minerals. They find that these are the interglacial periods, the warmest periods. Note that all three of the previous ones before ours were warmer than this one. The sea was up to 40 to 100 feet higher in, these, in, in this one, and maybe 100 feet higher in these, because we just didn't get that warm to melt as much ice as happened during those interglacial periods. And here is the CO2, the blue. Now, Al Gore said, obviously, that the CO2 is causing the temperature. They're so perfectly aligned. Except when it comes to cause-effect again, the effect never comes before the cause. Oceans have 50 times as much CO2 in them as the atmosphere does, and so one. And when oceans cool, they absorb gases, and when oceans warm, they give off gases. That's why that relationship occurs. But here, 
This is the CO2, lowest CO2 level in Earth's history, 180 parts per million, which is only 30 parts per million above the death of plants. So plants were starving to death at, during this period. And here is my favorite one. This is since the Little Ice Age, which was about between 1550 and 1600. People starved in northern countries because of the so-called and the crops failed. You can see this natural trend of warming in the modern Ice Age. This happened in the Roman Warm Period, the Medieval Warm Period, and now the Modern Warm Period. They're all in about 1,000-year cycles. <coughs> We don't, again, we don't know exactly why this happens, but it's for some reason. But you, you see, here's the CO2 curve. The amount of CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere never really got to be anything much until about here. And this line isn't following it up. If, if, it, if, if CO2 was indeed the cause of warming, it would have turned up like this. And it didn't. This is, a, this is all done with thermometers in England. This one is a very recent one, showing the number of deaths due to, to cold and heat in Europe. And this is the graph that was published. This is the, 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 the deaths from heat and the deaths from cold. So this is what they published, exaggerating these deaths by heat by 10 times versus this. This says 50, this says 10. This is 50, this is 50. So this is the true relationship between heat deaths and cold deaths. Bjorn Lomberg took these numbers and put it, did this to it. There is a sea of plastic garbage twice the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here's, for some reason, there's two of them in this uh, rendition. They're all a bunch of fake images. They, they, they just paint these things. You'll see here, Here's another one, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's almost as big as the United States. <laughs> but they just drew it on there and then made it a little bit that color and put these arrows there as if it's circling around madly, uh, <laughs> killing all of marine life or something. And then this one, that, that's the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's about the size of Brazil. Kill the ocean in less than 10 years. Why would plastic kill the ocean? Because it's toxic, right? When it goes in the ocean, it becomes toxic. That's why we wrap all our food in plastic. <laughs> Does anybody ever think of that? No, I don't know why. That's pretty much two and two right there. And that plastic is used on our food to keep it from being contaminated. It's non-toxic. Here is a thing that says it's a part of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch here. I looked at it for a bit and said, why are there mountains in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> this is the debris from the tsunami that killed almost 20,000 people in Japan. That's kind of rude, isn't it? This has nothing to do with the plastic garbage patch in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Here's the truth. This is a composite photo from a German satellite taking pictures over a whole year where they use the places that are not cloudy and make, make a composite of it. So you could see whatever is there. You can see the Hawaiian Islands just fine, even the little ones. You can see New Zealand and all this. No Pacific garbage patch. There is none. So when I, people come up to me afterwards and say, but it's just a clear plastic, that's why you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, no. Clear plastic actually sinks. It's, it's denser than water, whereas many of the colored plastics float for whatever reason. And then the next guy comes up and says, it's just below the surface, like as if every piece of plastic has a buoyancy compensation device on it. If you know your physics. And then they say, it's microscopic. It's, it's invisible. That's why my book is titled Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. Because I have this theory, the universal theory of scare stories, which is that all the scare stories are based on things that are either invisible, like radiation, carbon dioxide, and whatever the bad thing is in GMOs. It doesn't have a name. 
Everything has a name if it exists. So they just say there's something bad in there. They don't know what it is, though. If you don't know what it is, that means you don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, I've seen that logic. And uh, then I just give up. <laughs> sure, it's microscopic. Actually, Pacific, uh, the federal government fisheries people have gone out there with very, very fine mesh nets and gone up through the water column to find the invisible microscopic plastic and they don't find anything. And this is a top scientist at the Nanaimo Biological Station. So this, this is uh, 48 days of searching for plastic between Hawaii and California. You find out that nearly all of it is discarded fishing gear. Fishermen only have so much room on their boat. They want to save it for fish and ice, generally, and fuel and water for drinking and food. So they throw away damaged plastic fishing gear. It's not going to kill anything. As a matter of fact, as you'll see, Greenpeace says the crab is trapped in the cup. No, it's using it as a home. It's using it for a habitat. That's one of the neatest things about plastic, is wood in the ocean is very, very uh, common. Driftwood coming down rivers flooding from taking out trees on the banks and stuff. There's driftwood all over the world. And that produces habitat for many, many species. Up to 200 species are able to take advantage of the little floating reef that a piece of wood is. The same thing is true of plastic. Only plastic has shapes that are different from wood. There's no wood that's shaped like a cup. So this actually bottles and uh, uh, plastic bottles and plastic cups can you can can be had at that. Here's a plastic fishing ball, fishing float. These are uh, deep sea barnacles, pelagic barnacles. So the, the plastic actually serves a purpose for habitat for many different species. And other species come and eat what's on what's growing on the wood and, and on the plastic, etc. etc. This is not a real problem. As a matter of fact, it's probably got more positive than negative. David Attenborough, what a sellout. Yeah. He, he says albatross feed chick plastic bread. Plastic was heartbreaking. He says they're feeding their chicks plastic bags. There's one of his uh, helpers showing a plastic bag. There is no way that an albatross mother or father, because they both feed the chicks, would put a plastic bag in their beak. It, it's, it, it would ch choke them. They, they say these things were all found in baby, baby albatross. See what the albatross is actually giving the chick? Appropriate size and shaped pieces of plastic to use in their gizzard as a grinding tool, along with all the other things that birds give to their chicks when they can't fly away and get the pebbles for themselves. Land birds almost all use pebbles for this. Because birds have no teeth and therefore they cannot chew big things up. It goes to their gizzard where it's ground up. So they give them a squid this big, down their gullet, it goes into the gizzard, not into the normal stomach where there's acid to digest it like we have. So they have two stomachs. When it, when it dissolves the squid, it grinds it up, it keeps the beak as a grinding thing. So they, they, know, they know how to do that. They know how to keep the pebbles in their gizzard. They know how to keep the hard bits of plastic in their gizzard till they wear out. You have to keep doing this every six months or a year, keep either feeding the chicks or feeding yourself. Birds do this all through their whole life. There's nothing harmful about it. It's been studied thoroughly. And even the Smithsonian Institute buys into Greenpeace propaganda about this killing baby birds. As a matter of fact, the population of most seabirds has risen dramatically through the last hundred years as the feather hunt came to an end. Feathers for women's hats and all kinds of various things uh, meant that people went to these islands and just slaughtered the birds because they're, they're pretty easy, easy targets. This is a, a setup. The, 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 the internet is full of these, showing the, the terrible amount of plastic. Like there's a really sharp pointed pink thing here. The mother bird, the adult birds would never feed anything like that, or this. 
you know, this, and there's no possibility that a bird's gizzard could hold that much stuff. It's totally, and there's, there's all kinds of these pictures. Just like with the garbage patch, they put these pictures. Okay, here's where the carbon is in CO2 and in the Earth's crust as carbonaceous rocks and fossil fuels. The red are flows from the land to the air, from the air to the sea, from the sea to the land, and from the land to the rocks of the earth. All of that's in flows. The blue is amounts. The atmosphere has about 850 billion tons of carbon in it as CO2. And so here, on, right here, it shows our amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere for burning fossil fuels every year. It's 10 billion metric tons of carbon as CO2. So you've got <coughs> plants here uh, are eating 120 billion tons a year. So there's a fair balance between the inputs and outputs in the atmosphere and the soil and the ocean. But we've come along and we have added this component, which has caused the atmospheric carbon dioxide to increase substantially in the last 100 years, which most of us think is a good thing. I'll show you why. This is where most of the carbon that I show you the graph of CO2 gradually declining, declining, declining over the ages. This is where most of it went. Carbonaceous rocks, limestone, and chalk and marble. All of those are life origin rocks. They weren't made from volcanoes. They were made by living things, the shells of living things. And here's the fossil fuels, which also were made by living things. But as you can see, the amount of carbon in fossil fuels is very small compared to the amount that is in carbonaceous rocks, as they're properly called. Here's what life looked like 550 million years ago when it became multi multicellular. You will see that there's only one here with a shell. The rest of them are soft. And at the beginning, all of the life forms, well, this might be some kind of shell too, and here. But most of life was like a jellyfish. But eventually, life in the oceans evolved to have many, many species that took carbon dioxide from the water, mixed it with with, car with, with uh, calcium and made calcium carbonate, which is what all these shells are made from. These are microscopic coccolithophores. They're, they're phytoplankton, they're plants, they're the basis of the food chain in the ocean, along with other phytoplanktons. This is a foraminifer. <coughs> these, these little guys fit through these holes. These ones go through the water column and eating these. <coughs> And corals are 50% of all the carbon that's been lost to the sediments over the millions of years. And then there's the shellfish and, and the shrimps and lobsters and all that. 100 million, 100 million billion tons of CO2. And this is interesting. This is Vancouver Island, where I'm from. We're from here, no, here, where the blue thing is, Comox. Limestone Island, Limestone Company, Limestone Lake, Limestone Lines, Limestone Inlet, Limestone Mountain. Half of that Island is made of limestone. It all came from life. And it all removed carbon from the circulation of the fluid bodies, the atmosphere and the oceans, and set it in stone. So it cannot be recovered. <coughs> these are the white cliffs of Dover. They are made with these shells of coccolithophores, the little tiny guys shows you up top there, right there. That's what they're made from. There's hundreds of millions of tons of chalk in those cliffs. Okay, coral reefs have produced about 50%, as I mentioned, of the calcium carbonate that's trapped in the Earth's crust and lost to the atmosphere and oceans over the millennia. There's an example of the variety tremendous variety of snails and clams and stuff. The forests emerged 
about 450 million years ago, I'm sorry, 350 million years ago, uh, and, and they, they, before that, everything was flat on the ground, vegetation. There was no stems. Stems were made possible by lignin being associated with cellulose to make a column. It's very much similar to a reinforced concrete pillar. At that time, there was no enzyme made by any rotting plant or species, decomposer, that could digest lignin. So that coal seam there is the result of dead trees piling up on top of each other for nearly a hundred million years with nothing that could digest them. White rock fungus, it's called. Eventually, this species evolved, Trimetes, and had an enzyme that could digest lignin, and suddenly the amount of coal being created was cut by 95%. And none of those big seams occurred since then. Coal has been continued to be made through history, but 50% of it was made in that period when nothing could digest trees yet. All the CO2 we are putting into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels and making cement <coughs> are being returned to where they came from. It's not as if we are adding to the natural level of CO2. CO2 has dramatically declined from 6,000 parts per million at the beginning of that 500 million year slide. It's, it's gone from 6,000 parts per million to 180 at the, at the low point that it got to in the most recent glacial maximum. This is what would happen if humans hadn't come along. My paper on this is titled The Positive Impact of CO2 of Human CO2 Emissions on the Survival of Life on Earth. We are actually the salvation of life. No other species would have figured out how to make the coal and oil and gas burn. No other species could figure that out, never mind getting it out of the ground. We were able, we came able to do that. And as a, as a result of doing that, this is what would have happened. This is where it, where it got to 20,000 years ago. Because the worst Earth has warmed a bit during this modern war period, CO2 went up a bit more to, to 280 before we started putting it in. Now it's 425 because of what we've done. And now plants are reacting to it in a marvelous way. So we came along here. Now we're putting CO2 back up again. We have saved life from certain death by eventual starvation for lack of CO2. This is absolutely no way you could argue with it. This is 160 million years of constant decline of CO2 being lost to the sediments because of the shellfish mainly. This is this Royal Horticultural Society. This is supposed to be a scientific group. It's true, you really should talk to your plants, especially if you're a woman. It has nothing to do with talking. It has to do with breathing out 50,000 ppm of CO2 every time you exhale. And women are probably not so shy. Men would not like to, be a, to appear as if they're somehow talking to the plant, or whatever, with the plant. And, and so I think that's why they do better with women, is because they'll go up closer to the leaves and blow their CO2 up. <laughs> is my thesis more likely than theirs? <laughs> so. They say it's because of what you're saying. Somehow. There we go. This is the effect of increasing CO2 in the atmosphere with all else being equal except the CO2 levels that these trees are growing in. This was done, this experiment was done quite a few years ago when CO2 had only been brought up to 385 from 280. But you can see here by adding another 150, by adding another 300, adding another 450, it just keeps going. The, the optimum level for plants is around 2,000 parts per million, and it's at 420 now. Mm -hmm. This is why virtually all commercial greenhouse growers increase the CO2 in their greenhouse 
to somewhere between 800 and 1,000 to get 60% increased growth in their plants. The only reason they don't go up to 2,000 is there's a diminishing return in CO2 cost money. So it's where, where does the, where's the crossover where you're still making money from increasing the, the plant. Polar bears have become extinct due to climate change. This is the, uh, the other aspect of fake invisible catastrophes. It's about things that are either invisible or so remote that no one can check it out for themselves. Right? So polar bears and coral reefs are the primary suspects. And they make all kinds of claims. Polar bears would not exist if it weren't for climate change. Polar bears evolved from the Eurasian brown bear, what we call the grizzly bear, which came here from the old world just like people did over the, the Bering Bridge when the sea level dropped 400 feet during the glacial maximums. And the, the ice started getting further and further in, into the Arctic as the world cooled into the Pleistocene. And pretty soon ice came right down to the northern Russian shore and the Norwegian shore. And brown bears went out on the ice and found out that they could hunt seals out there. And gradually over at least 500,000 years or so, maybe even a million years, the ones that went out on the ice turned into a subspecies of the grizzly bear of the Eurasian. They are, they are still able to mate. It's a very recent event in evolutionary history because the Ice Age didn't start until 2.6 million years ago. So that polar bears only had that long to become a completely distinct subspecies because they can still mate. Many people say the definition of a species is they can mate with each other. If they can't, then they're not the same species. So they're, they're kind of breaking the rules a little bit here by saying that the polar bear is a distinct species from the brown bear. It weighs half as much again because you have to pull a 300 pound seal up through a hole in the ice. So the, the brown bear never had to do anything like that. They turned white because of the snow and ice, of course, and uh, they have a different diet, dietary system because they eat mostly uh, marine life rather than bushes and berries. This is what climate change looks like according to the National Geographic. This is a starving old bear and on its last legs. Probably has no teeth left. There are no old folks homes for polar bears. <laughs> they die in the wild. And the National Geographic took nine months to retract this lie. Because this is in the summer. People think, oh my god, there's no ice on the Arctic anymore. Lots of the, about half the Arctic goes, goes non-ice in the, in the end of the summer, in September, when the sun stops coming up again. But this is something, isn't it? So there is the summer ice. This is what the greens show everybody. They say, look, the ice is disappearing. This was March of 2023, last year. The ice is not only covering every square inch of the Arctic Circle, it's going down into the Bering Sea, down, down into Greenland, uh, way down towards Sweden and there. It's, and it covers way more than the Arctic. It is not disappearing. It has gone, it goes up and down in sight, some cycles. But it's definitely not disappeared. And Al Gore said it would be gone by now, 2013 or something. <coughs> and this is why it's good to have this open water in the summer. If the ice was covering the whole of the Arctic, there would be no sunlight penetrating the surface to make phytoplankton, which is the, the basis of the food chain in the sea. This being a food chain. So the plankton gets made, the krill eat the plankton, the fish eat the krill, the seals eat the fish, and the polar bears eat the seals. So it's good for the polar bears to have this open ocean in the summer. The, the conundrum here is why don't they eat the uh, internal organs? They eat the heart and the liver and everything and, 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 and take it right down to the bone. 
So I don't know the answer to that. I, I, if anybody knows, let me know. <laughs> okay, now the coral reefs. This is 2016. And then we left. 93% of the Great Barrier Reef now bleached. 93% of the Great Barrier Reef is practically dead. Bleaching, coral bleaching, 90%. So first you would notice that bleach doesn't say dead. It says bleached. Bleaching is not death in a coral. They usually recover from that. It's just an aspect of where they reject the plankton that's inside them. Because they are clear, they're like a jellyfish, and the coral is white. So a bleached coral looks like this. But this coral is still alive. It's polyps, which are animals. They're a, they're, they're a, 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 a union between an animal and a plant. And uh, this is the, the animal is inside. Each one of these bumps represents an animal called polyps. And but it's not dead. You, it's a natural event which coral usually recovers from fully. Shouldn't scientists and eco reporters know this? No. They pretend they don't. The Great Barrier Reef is now terminal. <laughs> the Great Barrier Reef at terminal stage. This is the next year, 2017. The Great Barrier Reef is in its final terminal stage, as if there are other terminal <laughs> stages before the final one. <laughs> That's journalism for you. None of these said dead. They all said dying or bleached or terminal or terminal is still alive. You don't say someone is terminal when they're dead already. You know. <clears throat> well, this is the next year, 2018. Great Barrier Reef definitely not dead. <laughs> Great Barrier Reef showing signs of recovery. Coral Reef show remarkable ability to recover from near death. <laughs> so do people have a remarkable ability to recover from near death. <laughs> there you go. Oh, coming to the present time, Great Barrier Reef area shows highest coral cover in 36 years. <laughs> this was last summer. Oh, you know, and this got no play. It only got in Axios, a web, you know, web-based thing. None of the big newspapers covered it. None of the big magazines covered it. So everybody still thinks the coral reefs are dead. How many people here thought that the coral reefs were dying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's because nobody's telling you the truth. The warmest seas are in the coral triangle, which is also the, by far the most biodiverse coral habitat and marine fish habitat. It's the epicenter of biodiversity in the world's oceans. But they say that if they get a little bit warmer, all the corals will die. No, they will spread out further because they like being warm. They don't like cold. And the reason the Caribbean and this area are warmer than the rest of the world's oceans, like the Red Sea as well, is because the cold water from the north and south don't get to the, don't get to these areas, and here too, the, the continents uh, protect them from large incursions of cold water. The, the, the Caribbean has lost 50 percent of its coral species in the last 50 million years, which I showed you there from the Eocene thermal maximum. They've lost half their species because of cold, and the most biodiverse corals in the whole world are in the warmest oceans in the whole world. Eileen and I have been there, just came back from the, in November from a, a scoop, a snorkel dive uh, for two weeks on a beautiful ship with only 12 guests, a small boat, really. small ship, big boat. And uh, we went to the most remote part of Indonesia, which is the Banda Islands, formerly known as the Spice Islands, which the Europeans fought over for the nutmeg that was there before Columbus even came to America. This is the beauty of the coral reefs. I took all these photos just last fall. These are nudibranchs. They come in all shapes and colors and sizes. This is a giant clam. They come in so many different patterns of color you wouldn't believe in. In this picture alone, there's about 20 species of coral. And, the, the, and, and the fish are just everywhere. It is, it, it, I tell people if they haven't seen this, 
they've missed half the world. Because mm -hmm. there's more biodiversity in a given area there than there is anywhere in the terrestrial ecosystem in the world. Um, this is a, something that not many people in North America know about, but waste to energy is one way to in, increase our use of things, beneficial use of things, uh, to not put them in a landfill to leach toxic waste into the uh, water tables. And you can do this, you, even if you put pieces of construction wood full of nails, it, this, the, the molten iron comes out the bottom, it gets everything, and it creates electricity with the steam that it makes, and it's very good. But in North America, we throw 50% of our waste into landfills instead of using it for that. Um, here's global energy consumption, and here's what it's used for. The reason I'm a very strong supporter of nuclear energy, which I, I worked with the U.S. Nuclear Energy Institute for six years in, in Washington, D.C., going there every month for a week, and uh, I, I already knew quite a lot about nuclear energy because of the early campaigns with Greenpeace and stuff. And uh, I uh, realized that all these three categories are stationary uses. It's not something moving. It's only transportation that makes it so much easier with fuel because it can go in a pipe. Gas and oil and diesel can be in a tank and go in a pipe to the engine. <coughs> Whereas a stationary building, which uses about 35 to 40 percent of all our energy, everything can be done with nuclear. The heating, the cooling, the lighting, the hot water, whatever tools are used in there, everything can be done with electricity from nuclear plants. And New York just shut down two of its nuclear plants that were good for another 30 years. So, everything stationary, even some big things that move around slowly are can be tethered to a, a, to a cable. And they just, just drag it around. And uh, lots of mining troubles are, are electric by cable. And big steel mills and huge manufacturing facilities, they're, they're, they're in one place that, that can use the nuclear energy. So if you look back here, you can see that nuclear energy could take over 75% of our fossil fuel use today, right off the bat. And then there's these things. If you can take a submarine with 100 people on it and 100 nuclear missiles on it underwater for 30 days with a nuclear engine, you can probably propel just about anything that floats on the water with nuclear. And indeed, that's what Russia has done with its nuclear fleet in the, the Arctic. So it doesn't have to be refueled all winter, because the fuel lasts for a long, long time in nuclear. These ships would all be nuclear powered, and so could these. Running a nuclear, uh, nu nuclear engine, nuclear uh, plant, is no more difficult than running a, a diesel engine. There are people who are looking at screens and, and, and making sure that everything is going properly. No, not one person has died from a nuclear accident in North America with over 100 nuclear reactors running 24-7. Not one. China loses thousands of people in coal mines every year. And, and other countries do too. So nuclear is one of the safest technologies we've ever invented, and it's, it's a miracle. There's so many miracles about it, I can't tell you them all. All these trains, so, it's, so even transportation, much of it can be done with nuclear energy. Because you can electrify the tracks, as so many countries are doing and have done. This is Russia's latest fast reader reactor. It's a... Uh, 340 megawatts, I think, or no, it's more than that. It's 860 megawatts. It's a big reactor. It's running on plutonium, which is the waste product from burning uranium. See, most people don't realize that only 0.8% of natural uranium is fissile. 
in other words, can be used as a nuclear fuel. All the rest of it, uranium-238, has to be stored as waste. It can all be turned into plutonium. And a breeder reactor means that you make more new fuel than you started with. It's like the biblical uh, loaves and fishes. Jesus fed a multitude with one fish and four loaves of bread. The uranium-238 is the one fish and four loaves of bread. It can multiply the nuclear fuel supply initially by using all the uranium-238 by 100 times. Then, you can go to thorium. Now, thorium is not fissile either. There's fissile and fertile. Uranium-238, 35 is fissile, in other words, will burn. Uranium-238, though, is not fissile, but it's fertile. You can make it fissile, in other words. And you can make all of the uh, thorium into a fissile isotope called uranium-233 in a nuclear reactor. You do this. Then there's almost no waste left over. And there's a thousand times more fuel produced this way. They're doing it. They run fine, these reactors. Well, this is just showing that most Western European countries either recycle or waste of energy. They have no landfills, these first countries. Then as you go further east into Europe, you get more and more landfill and less and less recovery. So it's possible to do this in every country in the world, including Canada and the United States, but we're more like this than this. And we could do it. This is the largest wasting energy plant in the world in China. I think it's 180 megawatts, which is a good sized generator. This is why you shouldn't build a community in a coniferous forest. In California, the uh, campfire, as it's called, started by an electrical wire coming down on a tree, in a tree that shouldn't have been there because if the electrical wire can come down on it, it should be cut down and taken away somewhere turned into slumber, to lumber. But look at where they left the trees. These are all pitchy pine trees. And there's all the dead wood on the floor that nobody's cleaning up. So when it catches fire, the whole place goes up in flames. And as you can see, the trees did a lot better than the houses. <laughs> Over 90 people died in this. And it's just a shame. But here's what you do if you know something about urban forestry. You don't put any coniferous trees in it because they're pitchy. You put broadleaf trees in it, and then you'll never get a forest fire. You have big open places, too, that would, that would stop a fire from spreading. But so these, these guys in New York, we just got some fear out of it. <laughs> a few things they don't want to do. So, if you leave a forest like this and it catches on fire, it's just going to be an inferno. It's going to go up into the crown, what they call a crown fire. That's what happened at the camp. These forests are being mismanaged so badly in the western United States especially, and we're going down the same road here in Canada in many ways, thinking that forests are sacred or something, you shouldn't be using the wood, you know, all that sort of thing. It's just ridiculous. It's okay to have open spaces in the, in the landscape. In the old days it happened by fire. It can also happen by logging. And especially if you replant the trees and look after them, what's wrong with that? You know, but it's getting to be on Vancouver Island, we're not being allowed to cut any more big trees. Now, how do you get a big tree unless you plant a small one? You know? This is the U.S. Forest Service. This was the graph they used to show. Now they cut it off here and say they don't know where this data came from. It came from them. They're the only ones that were keeping track of how much forest fires have been. This is because Smokey the Bear was invented. <laughs> right in here, this is what Smokey the Bear did when people started caring about making sure big forest fires didn't happen, partly because of the damage to towns. Now it's gone up recently largely because the Greens are happy with this in federal lands in the West. And so there's so like 70% of Idaho belongs to the, the Washington. It's because it's federal land. That's a huge amount of the West is federal land. And so that land is all controlled from Washington, where the politicians outnumber the politicians in the West, the eastern, east of the Mississippi. So they don't care 
what the forests do in the West. It's a big mess. By, by 1750, with the bit, bit industry coming on, glass, glass plants, smelting plants and all that, along with heating all the buildings, the forests had been reduced to less than 10% of Europe's area, <coughs> east and west. 10%, less than 10%. Today, forests cover 43% of Europe. Because of fossil fuels. <coughs> this is the Amazon watershed. They, they say it's being destroyed from one end to the other. You can fly five hours over this and never see a, a, a patch of, 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 of felled trees. It's, it's still 90% intact. And yet, because nobody goes there, it's invisible. And reporters and politicians tell us that it's disappearing. This is the second largest crop of the forest in the world, the, the Congo. Look at that. There's a little bit of development here. It just isn't very much going on there. And they say it's disappearing too. So they're wrong about that. Um, this is the result of CO2 increase in the atmosphere by human beings. We have increased the biodiversity of the Earth by 30%. Because when you increase CO2, you not only give the plant more food, a more concentrated form of food, but you also make it use less water. Becomes more efficient with water. There can, thereby can grow in places. There are trees marching out onto grasslands all around the world now, down in so, like the, the U.S. Southwest, where there's lots of dry places. They are coming back with trees, because trees need more water than the little plants. And that's what's going to happen as we continue to increase the level of CO2 into the atmosphere, hopefully up to around 800, in other words, nearly double what it is now. And that will be an extremely positive thing for life on Earth. We are life's salvations, not its destroyers. There is no climate emergency. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'll be happy to take any questions.